Hello, my name is Drew Lyon. I'm the Washington State University Small Grains Extension and Research Weed Scientist in Pullman, Washington. And I'm going to be talking to you today about rat tail fescue, Vulpia miros, which uh, is a small grass, but it causes big problems in our direct seed systems uh, in eastern Washington. Rat tail fescue is a winter annual. That means it germinates, tends to germinate in the fall, uh, comes up in the late fall, early winter, and then completes its life cycle in the spring. It has tightly folded, narrow leaf blades, which kind of sets it apart from many other uh, grassy weeds you see out there. It really doesn't look like a very good competitor, but it's able to form uh, dense mats, which uh, can cause quite a bit of problem when they get established. It has a narrow, compact seed head, which emerges in May uh, into early June. Uh, it has long awns, as can be seen in this picture, and the seeds are in a congested panicle at the top. It's self-pollinating, reproducing by seed only, and like a lot of uh, grass weeds, it has a short seed survival in the soil, so the seed do not stay viable for more than uh, two to three years on the outside, maybe four or five, but generally fairly short-lived in the soil. Grows up to three feet tall, but you usually will only see it to one to two feet tall unless it's growing in a very good situation without a lot of competition. It has a shallow fibrous root system, which makes it susceptible to drought. Um, it also makes it susceptible to tillage because it doesn't have a deep, deep root system that can come back from. So shallow root system, short plant, doesn't look like much, but because it can form these dense mats of residue, such as this uh, picture taken by Dan Ball and Andrew Halting and shown in the PNW Extension Bulletin 613. You get a mat like that formed and it's very difficult for, um, for your crop to come up and compete with that. Also, the residue of rat tail fescue has been found to be allelopathic to wheat seedlings. That means there are chemicals in that uh, residue that reduce the root and shoot elongation in wheat. And so wheat has trouble coming up through that dense mat of all that residue with these allelopathic effects. So it becomes quite a problem for getting wheat established uh, where you have these dense mats of rat tail fescue residue. As I mentioned earlier, rat tail fescue is intolerant of repeated tillage. And so we really haven't seen rat tail fescue as a problem in our conventional tillage systems. It's when we get away from tillage entirely and our direct seed systems that rat tail becomes a, a real problem and um, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, glyphosate is only marginally effective on controlling it. Um, it requires higher rates and often repeated applications and as we'll discuss uh, here in a bit I also think there's some coverage issues with it again because of that very narrow tightly folded leaf small size of the plant. I'm not sure we're always getting really good coverage with our herbicides and that may be part of the reason we're having difficulties controlling rat tail fescue. So if we look at uh, some work that's been done on controlling rat tail fescue, we can see this uh, data from Dan Ball and, and Andrew Holting again at Oregon State University um, published in PNW 613 Extension Bulletin. We have visual control on our vertical axis and we have the rate of uh, herbicides applied on our horizontal axis. Uh, the blue bars are from the early post treatments. Uh, this is herbicide sprayed when the rat tail fescue had just one, two, maybe three tillers on it. And late post, it generally had uh, five or more tillers, five to 10 tillers on it when it was sprayed. What you can see in this slide is that uh, increased rates of glyphosate help control a little bit and also that earlier applications, that is in the early tiller stage, one to three tillers, generally provided better control than when applying at uh, later growth stages. But really none of these gave us the type of control we'd like to see. We don't have 85, 90, 95% control with any of these treatments. What, um, what that group found uh, working on this uh, ball and halting is that um, they actually got better control with repeated applications of glyphosate. So again, we have visual control on a vertical axis and on a horizontal axis, we have the rate, um, the, the rate before the slash is the amount applied early post, again, in that one to three tiller stage. And then the late post is the amount of glyphosate applied after or in the late post stage, which is uh, five to 10 tillers. 
So what they were finding is you could get that control up closer to that 90% control by repeated measure, by repeated application. So applying 24 ounces early post and then coming back with 16 was quite effective. Uh, 16, 24 also. Uh, we broke 90% if we put 24 ounces uh, early post and again post uh, or late post. So we want to put this on a couple times It'll improve our application or our control if we can if we can make more than one application. Uh, we decided to do a little study here at uh, Washington State uh, on the campus, and um, we did a dose rate response study to see what kind of rates we needed to kill uh, rat tail fescue. And this is just a slide of some of the plants on the far left with the blue tags. That's all our control. So that's um, rat tail fescue without any application. And then we applied rates from eight to 64 ounces of glyphosate uh, going from left to right. And what you can tell there is that it really didn't take a whole lot of glyphosate to, to, to damage or to hurt the uh, rat tail fescue, which is contrary to what people tell us is happening in the field. But one thing you might notice is that these are greenhouse grown plants. And if you look at the control plants, you see that they're fairly tall, the leaves are long, and generally out in the field, what you get is uh, much shorter leaves, a more stubby plant. And so I think we're probably getting better um, coverage on these plants than you do out in the field. And these plants are also growing much more actively. The other thing we noticed, um, well, first let's take a look at the dose response. So we take a look at biomass uh, 20 days after treatment as a percent of the control. And on the horizontal axis is our rate in ounces per acre. And what we can see is it takes very little. At eight ounces, we already have greater than 50% uh, reduction in biomass. So we're getting a, we're getting, doesn't take a whole lot of glyphosate to get that reduction when done in the greenhouse. So you can see that the, the curve is rather steep and then flattens out as we get out to the upper rates. But one thing we noticed uh, at 20 days is that some of these plants that were looking rather uh, dead started to shoot up little um, uh, little buds at the at the base of the plant, so they started to send up new shoots, um, and uh, those plants were starting to regrow. And I think that probably also occurs out uh, in the field. And so we've redone the study, or we're in the process of redoing the study, and we're going to take a control rating at 20 days, clip the plants, and then allow them to grow another 20 days, and see how much regrowth we get out of that because that may be part of the problem as well is that we we burn off the top growth and we basically release the ancillary buds down in the crown and they shoot new growth. Now not all plants did that but a good number of plants did and so we'll be looking at that in further studies. If we look at some work again done by a group of people uh, in the Pacific Northwest they did studies in five locations Pendleton, Corvallis, Genesee, Moscow, and Pullman in 2004 and 2005 and they looked at weed control again on the vertical axis and several different herbicides. Define is um, the active ingredient defined is flufenacet and flufenacet is also in axiom. Flufenacet plus metribuzin makes axiom but they didn't want to have the effect of uh, looking at the metribuzin so they just used define so they're just using the flufenacet which is the most active compound on rat tail fescue. So these are several different Products define or flufenacet uh, at 9.6 ounces, uh, Maverick at 0.67, Osprey 4.75 beyond, and then the define Maverick, define Osprey, define beyond. And what you see is the the, the uh, Maverick, Osprey, and beyond, which are all sulfa or they're all group two herbicides, sulfonylureas and imidazolones, don't really provide a whole lot of control of rat tail fescue. It is really the flufenacet and the define. Uh, when added to these products that give us control. So flufenacet is also an axiom with metribuzin, and we would expect that to control rat tail fescue, you probably want to have a soil applied product like axiom on the ground and then maybe follow up with some of these other uh, products like Maverick, Osprey, or beyond in the spring. So a fall application of a soil applied followed by spring post-emergence. Here's another uh, study done by Nevin Lawrence and Ian Burke at Washington State University. This was a two-year study, so it's putting together data from two separate field years. Again, visual control on our vertical axis and several products on the, on the bottom here. We have PowerFlex, uh, early spring post-emergence, 
uh, Zidua, which just recently got labeled in wheat, but not at the rates we're showing here. It's labeled at, at an ounce, ounce and a quarter, and we're using a little higher rates in this study because that was the rates we were looking at when we were originally um, looking at this product. Uh, so Zidua is pyroxysulfone, and it's a soil applied product, and then Axiom, and then Zidua, followed by PowerFlex, Zidua uh, at 1.7 ounces, followed by PowerFlex and Axiom PowerFlex. And what we see again is where we have uh, Zidua down, a soil applied either Zidua or Axiom, uh, followed by a spring post, we get some pretty good control. So again, the soil applied products, whether it's either Axiom or Zidua, are important for the control. We don't want to rely totally on a post-emergence application for rat tail fescue control. Um, Bruce Palmer, who's the uh, agronomist uh, researcher with McGregor Company, he did a study in 2013 on rat tail fescue, and uh, he basically showed pretty good control with anything he used. So he had Valor out of two ounces. That didn't provide quite the control he wanted, but all these other products did. Fierce is a combination of Valor and pyroxysulfone, the same active ingredient as Zidua. So we, again, we have soil applied products all through here, uh, either Zidua or Axiom, and then with or without a post-emergence. And all of these provided very good control of rat tail fescue. Uh, if we look at the amount, of, the numbers in red at the top of the slide here, is this is the amount of injury that was caused to the winter wheat. So some of these products uh, didn't cause much injury, but you see Fierce, which is a combination again of Valor and Peroxisulfone, both products which can, can be injurious to wheat if you get uh, a lot of rain or a fair bit of rain after application. There is some risk of crop injury with, with um, these products. Uh, this is a study which uh, I conducted um, this past year, so one of my first studies looking at rat tail fescue control. And uh, we looked at Zidua at 1.7 ounces. Again, that's higher than what the labeled rate is going to be. Uh, Everest, uh, which is a group 2 uh, herbicide at 1 ounce. PowerFlex. Uh, and this Everest here, this first one was applied in the fall. PowerFlex in the fall. Uh, 3.5 and then we have some treatments where you put Zidua down at 0.85 ounces and then followed it with spring applications of either Everest at uh, three quarters of an ounce or one ounce or Everest by itself in the spring or PowerFlex. And what was interesting is that uh, the Everest was pretty poor when in the fall but our spring applied Everest actually provided pretty good control and if we combined Everest with uh, Zidua, an ounce of Everest in the spring with Zidua in the fall we, we obtained pretty good control with that. So again, same message, soil applied product in the fall followed by a spring application um, seems to give us a best control of rat tail fescue. And then this is an Anthem, and Anthem is FMC's uh, product, and that's uh, Cadet and Pyroxysulfone. And again, this isn't labeled, either is fierce. None of these pyroxysulfone things are labeled yet, but they're all working towards that. So we have Anthem, uh, five ounces, six and a half ounces, eight ounces, all of them providing pretty good control of uh, a rat tail fescue. Here's a put on PPI, drop just a little bit, and then uh, Anthem in the fall with PowerFlex applied later. And you can see it's mostly the soil applied with PowerFlex. Uh, maybe helping a little bit, but it's not doing the lion's share of the rat tail control. However, we did see a yield reduction with some of these anthem products. <coughs> so here's our check treatment, yielding a little over 105 bushels, about 106 bushels. PowerFlex without any pyroxysulfone. And then these treatments that have anthem and pyroxysulfone all seem to have taken a bit of a hit in yield. Um, and if, Go and look at the rainfall that occurred in this study. This is the precipitation ridges. These are the dates. Uh, we planted our wheat on 23rd of October. Anthem was applied the next day, and then we had a little bit of rain. And then uh, four or five days later, we got quite the rain. So we moved that product uh, down into the root zone, and that's probably what caused us some damage. So that's why you want to get both Axiom and my right cell phone, you're going to want to get, try to get that seed placed in the <coughs> half deep. And 
try to get it germinated before you put the product in. So, some take home messages real quick. In fallow, it seems that two glyphosate applications may work better than, than a single application. You don't have to really use a whole lot of glyphosate in either of those treatments if you're going to plan to come back and hit it a couple times. Uh, soil applied herbicides are an essential, essential component of rat tail fescue control. Right now, Axiom's uh, the one that's labeled and working well. And when the pyroxysol foam containing products come out, Zidua, uh, the ESF, and the FMC, and Fierce, uh, Bivalent, those products look to, uh, to bring some rat tail um, possibilities with them as well. So we'll have a couple different uh, products, and then you can combine those with some spring treatments, and that makes for a nice one two combination uh, for controlling the weeds. So I told you I just derived. This last year was my first year of research, so I really found out that rat tail is a major issue for our drag seeders. So this is a weed I want to crank up my research uh, efforts on. I want to take a look at effects of tillage and value here, that tillage is very effective on it. But we'd like to do as little tillage as possible if we're going to use tillage. So looking at how little is required um, at the uh, conservation farm in Pullman, we decided to uh, stop using the disc drill and go to, well, go to the horse drill and it just causes more disturbance and we think we actually see a reduction in rat tail just by using a higher disturbance drill versus a low disturbance drill. Maybe that's all we really need to do, but I want to take a look at very minimal up to something better and see just see how, how little we can get by with the frequency. So that's one area. And then effective herbicide rate, timing, carrier volume, that issue came up, nozzle type. I was talking to Bruce Palmer with McGregor, he said he was out in some fields and he noticed everywhere the, uh, the wheel tracks of the tractor or the sprayer rolled over the residue, he got a good kill on his rat tail fescue. And when he didn't, he didn't get a good kill, which would suggest that it's a coverage issue. You're knocking those plants over and getting more product on there. So can we use different nozzles or different gallon ridges or what can we do to get better coverage? Um, so we want to look at that. <coughs> and then if rate uh, timing of herbicides containing pyroxysulfone uh, for weed control and crop safety. These look like they'll be good tools, but we need to figure out how to manage them in this environment. Uh, a lot of labels, I think, on the, would agree that a lot of these labels are written kind of from a national perspective. And I can tell you this is coming from Nebraska. This part of the world is very different than <coughs> the other weed-growing parts of the country. So, trying to fine-tune this to work in our environments um, will be an important uh, factor there. So, this is my required slide to tell you that I talked about some stuff that wasn't labeled, and it's illegal to use things that aren't labeled. So, I am not advising use of any of those things. Uh, questions? Yes. Do you use gold in here? I don't know if you put gold on the fall in the fall and the fall of the axon. 
I'm going to have to go look at that. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's oh, labeled. Not yeah. I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. I didn't know. I don't yeah. throw it's that not wheat. It's not wheat. It's, it's a fallow herbicide, but you can't put gold on top of wheat or anything. Right. You said sugar beets back in Western Nebraska. Is that right? No. Is that right? No. Is that right? No. Is that Okay, so that's a good suggestion. I'll have to look at that. Anybody else try anything on rat tail that has looked promising or notice something you'd like to share? I guess. Um, it seems to me that you could uh, use like Axiom or some of these other products uh, to apply them uh, before another crop, let's say Provenzos uh, or Pulse. I have fall before you would see that pulse crop in the spring, and then you wouldn't have the risk of injury to your wheat that, that fall. Uh, but it's not late. Uh, but uh, that'd be another thing to try to look at. Uh, so try and control it in the non wheat crop and not in the crop. Okay. Yeah, before you can fall, before you find these problems. At one time, Bayer was thinking about registering axiom in pulses. It just like they could put it on pre plant or right after the plant with a chicken and eating and such. We need to be abandoned that effort of registering those problems. But your idea of putting it on fall before planting in the spring, we have to do is look at the plant back and go over And I can't tell you what it would be for the bill to the leg was but you're still pure. We can look at the layers. Oh, it could be done. It's possible. 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 It's Introduced a, a summer crop, so something we didn't plant until May. Then you can kill off everything that came up prior to that, and anything that came up after you planted in late April or May wouldn't fertilize and set seed. So all your crops are planted early enough where you can still get a fair bit of germination even after a, uh, after a crop. First of May. So that, that, that might, you, know, you might not, you might just have the opportunity to kill it off with. with uh, Glyphosate, I had a grower the other day tell me I'm going to need to look at Paraquat. He thought Paraquat worked really well for him on the rat tail. He burned it off before he planted the, the, the garbs. Plant them on the later side so you can make sure you get the flush you're going to get. Um, it is a winter annual, so it does need to be fertilized in order to set seed so you have to have enough cold treatment there. Otherwise, anything that came up isn't going to set seed. Eastern Colorado, Western Nebraska, joining goat grass, if it came up after April 15th, it didn't fertilize. So you might have a plant there, but it wasn't going to produce any seed for you. That's basically what you want to do with the rotation, is you want to stay, you don't want any seed production for that two to three year period before you go back into winter wheat, where you have less ability to stop the wheat seed production. So, those are good suggestions. Yes? Well, and that's where maybe something like Paraquat might work a little better. Um, but there you have to get really good coverage. So, and it does look like um, some, some of the papers I read, you want to have a little bit of growth on there. So that early hit and the later hit, or come back a little bit later. Yes, Wayne? Yeah, Drew, can you help me out with the biology of that plant a little bit? So you have, you have the growth, and you chop the growth off of glyphosate, and then you have the buds in the, in the crown. But then start to go after you basically decapitate that biochemical, right? That's what we. I mean, not all the plants do, but some do. No, that's what we're we're saying. What's that? This one. Does, <coughs> not all the. Well, you know, not, all, not all. Not every plant was <coughs> had that proliferation of new meristems. Just some. Oh. So it's not universal, but um, that is something that we saw in a number of the plants. So. 
but I, I think that could be part of the problem with small ones. You not only have you don't have very good leaf area to get the spray on, and a lot of people are spraying glyphosate at less than 10 gallons to the acre, and so you're just hoping you get a drop on there somewhere, and if you don't, so with a higher gallon, one of the things I want to look at, you know, generally you want to spray lower gallonage with Roundup, but maybe we need to be looking at a higher gallonage or a different uh, did you, look at the, did you look at the root mass on the plants? No. And that's, we're going to redo this study. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, I think that would be Thank you. 